Hi, my name is Dr. Ken Tyndall and I'm the CTO and co-founder of Canis Automotive Labs. Cryptography can do two things, provide secrecy where we can't see inside a message and authentication, being sure about the origin of a message. What it cannot do is provide protection against denial of service attacks. The bus can still be flooded with frames that bring everything to a halt. Authentication is the main purpose of cryptography in an embedded system. It provides a way to know that the message originated from a device and hasn't been tampered with, although we'll see shortly that there are some ways this breaks down. There are two classes of encryption algorithm, symmetric, where all participants share the same private key, kept secret for an observer, and asymmetric, where each device has its own private key and messages it to it can be encrypted with its public key. Asymmetric encryption is very slow, even with dedicated hardware. For encrypting traffic on CAN, we use symmetric encryption. Let's look in more detail at what CAN requires from cryptography. CAN was designed around the concept of publish-subscribe. For any given piece of information, there is a single publisher and many subscribers. This is why CAN frames have a CAN ID. One purpose of the ID is to identify the information. In fact, in the early days of CAN, there was a design assumption that one frame would carry one piece of center information, which is why CAN frames can be just one or two bytes long. The other purpose of the ID is to set the priority of the frame, which is crucial to CAN's real-time performance. That's a big topic in its own right. The idea is that a publisher device periodically broadcasts a CAN frame and subscribers listen for the frame containing the information they need. A subscriber can jump in any time and pick up the latest information. This is important. If a device goes through a watchdog timer restart, it must be up and running quickly. There's simply no time to negotiate a connection to every publisher of information needed and to negotiate keys. This means two things. Firstly, the keys must be pre-distributed to all subscribers, and this must be secure. The keys must be kept secret so that software on the device cannot see them. Otherwise, if the device is hijacked by malware, then it can just read the keys out. Secondly, the communication scheme must be random access. There should be no requirement to have all the previous messages received in order to decode the latest one. This sounds obvious, but quite a few encryption schemes only work point to point, where both ends have been present from the beginning of a session. That's okay for opening a web page in a browser, but not in a distributed real-time embedded control system. In fact, this is a general problem with trying to adapt mainstream computing solutions. It's a completely different domain, and those solutions often don't work. One final requirement to note, and this goes for any crypto application. Don't roll your own. Stick to standards. To quote Bruce Schneier, security has nothing to do with functionality. A cryptography product can function normally and be completely insecure. Flaws remain undiscovered until someone looks for them explicitly. So with all that in mind, let's look at a case study, a scheme for cryptography on CAN called CryptoCAN. CryptoCAN is a scheme designed by Canis Labs for communicating in standard CAN 2.0 frames that provides secrecy and authentication. It uses the standard AES encryption algorithm with 128-bit keys for encryption and the FIPS CMAC algorithm for generating a message authentication code, or MAC. The keys are already pre-shared and stored securely across the devices that need to communicate using CryptoCAN. The MAC is calculated on the message payload, which prevents the payload being tampered with, but also on the CAN ID, which prevents the payload of one message being reattached by an attacker to a different CAN ID. A freshness value is also included in the MAC calculation, which is provided by the application. This could be a sequence number that is known by the publisher and all the subscribers, or a timestamp kept in sync with a central time broadcaster. Let's see how CryptoCAN messages are formed. On the publish side, a plain text CAN frame plus a freshness value is passed into CryptoCAN. The CAN ID, DLC, payload and freshness value go through the CMAC calculation using a MAC key to create a 60-bit MAC. The CAN payload, DLC and MAC add up to 128 bits. This makes up an AES block that is encrypted using the cipher feedback or CFB mode. Cipher feedback uses the previous ciphertext and encrypts it. To start the process, a random 128-bit number called an initialization vector or IV is used. This is encrypted with the encryption key and then exclusively ORed with the plain text message block, including that MAC. This creates a ciphertext of 128 bits, or 16 bytes. This is split into two CAN frames, each with 8-byte payloads. The original CAN ID is used for the first frame, and the second frame uses the same CAN ID with one of the bits set to 1, 
so that the first frame has a higher priority and is sent first. For J1939, this ID encryption bit is the least significant bit of the priority field. The process repeats for each transmission of the CAN frame, and each time the ciphertext is fed back to generate the next block. On a subscriber side, the reverse operation takes place. The IV doesn't exist for the first message, so the first message received cannot be decrypted. Instead, the ciphertext is used to set the IV, and then the message is discarded. This means with CryptoCAN, the first message after a receiver starts is always lost. If this is a problem, for example with sporadic messages that are not repeated periodically, then the message can simply be sent twice. The decrypted MAC is verified by repeating the same calculation as the sender on the same values, payload, DLC, CAN ID, and freshness value. If the calculated MAC and receive MAC match, then the frame is valid and the payload can be used. CryptoCAN is designed to be implemented using a hardware security module, or HSM, and in particular, the one designed for automotive applications called Secure Hardware Extensions, SHE. SHE was created some years ago by the German automotive industry, and it's reasonably common in microcontrollers for the industry. It meets the requirements for CAN encryption we talked about, and implements AES with 128-bit keys and the FIPS-C MAC algorithm for message authentication. It also stores keys securely in a walled-off part of non-volatile memory. Keys can be reprogrammed using a secure load key algorithm, using a master key, with new key values encrypted and authenticated in such a way that no eavesdropper can see what the new keys are or tamper with them. SHE can also be used for secure firmware booting. The HSM stores a dedicated boot key and an expected Mac. When a bootloader runs hacked firmware through the HSM with a key, then the calculated Mac will not match the HSM stored Mac and the bootloader can refuse to run the firmware. An SHE HSM also includes a unique 128-bit factory program serial number and a cryptographically secure pseudo-random number generator, or CSPRNG. And there are permissions that are programmed with each key. Edit write only, disable when the debugger is connected, disabled on boot failure, and whether it's used either for encryption or for calculating a Mac. There are a minimum of three and a maximum of 17 user keys in the secure storage for keys. This turns out to be a problem. Any symmetric cryptographic scheme, including CryptoCAN, requires a pair of keys, one for authentication and one for encryption. Because SHE specifies only a minimum of three user keys, in practice this means that a single bus segment needs to use the same key pair for all encrypted traffic. If there are multiple bus segments and they're to use different keys, then the gateway must use an HSM that has at least a pair per segment and perform decryption and re-encryption as the messages pass through. In this case, messages are not secured end-to-end, -end, and that makes the gateway a particular target for attack, as, the as it's the place that can tamper with messages on the way through. There's another weakness. If a device with an SHE SHM gets hijacked, then the malware can create sp can spoof frames and ask the HSM to create the authentication code. It can do that for any frame where it has the key that the sender uses. If there's just a single pair of keys for a whole bus segment, then that's any sender. And other devices will accept that spoof frame as legitimate, because they will have a valid Mac. This completely undermines the entire point to using cryptography. The SHE Plus specification attempts to address this. SHE Plus adds an extra column in the key permissions table in the HSM. It's for MAC creation. Only the transmitter of the message can be allowed to generate a MAC with that key. Everyone else can only verify a received MAC with the key. This would normally fix the gaping hole, except for the problem of limited keys. Even if the HSM stores the maximum 17 user keys, then this is only a maximum of 16 unique authenticated senders per CAN bus segment. There's a further problem with cryptographic systems, replay attacks. Replay attacks are a problem because an attacker can capture CAN traffic and resend it later. The attacker can easily guess what the message does, and it would be very straightforward to collect a suite of useful messages like unlock the doors or switch off the engine. The receivers will sync to replayed messages, decode and validate them, after all, they were authentic when they were sent, and then use them. The conventional solution to this is to include a sequence number or timestamp, something that changes and can be used to detect stale messages. That's why the Autosar standard calls it a freshness value. CryptoCAN includes a freshness value in the MAC calculation. In practice, 
Checking freshness is quite tricky to do reliably. For example, what should the sequence number be if a sender has just reset itself? How do receivers know the number has changed? If there's a message to say sender has reset the freshness value, then what happens if the message is replayed too? Timestamps are also tricky. Every device needs to run on a shared view of time for this to work, and they have to be synchronized by a central clock. What if those broadcasts are replayed? There are solutions to these problems, but they add more complexity and add to the edge cases where the system can fail to communicate. Addressing the security problem creates a reliability problem. Thank you for watching. You can find out more about these topics from my blog site, kentindle.github.io, and you can contact me by email at ken.tindle at canislabs.com.